again, everyone, for being here. I'm really happy that you're able to join us for our keynote presentation this afternoon. I'm really excited to be able to introduce our keynote speaker, um, Dr. Thomas J. Tobin. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about him, and then I'm going to hand it over to him so he can go ahead and get started with the keynote presentation, which is going to be exciting and interactive today. So, Tom Tobin is a founding member of the Center for Teaching, Learning, and Mentoring at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, as well as an internationally renowned author and speaker on issues of quality and teaching with education, or teaching with education, <laughs> teaching with technology, including evaluating online teaching, academic integrity, copyright, and accessibility. He holds a PhD in English Literature, a second master's degree in Information Science, and a professional project management certification. A master online teacher certification, the Quality Matters Reviewer Certification, the Professional in Accessibility Core Competencies, or CPACC, certification, and he re recently completed the Academic Leadership Academy from Penn State. He tells his nieces and nephews that he is in 44th grade. <laughs> He's the author of several books, including Evaluating Online Teaching, Implementing Best Practices, The Copyright Ninja, Going Alt-Ac, A Guide to Alternative Academic Careers, and Reach Everyone, Teach Everyone, Universal Design for Learning in Higher Education. His keynote today is titled, Why Universal Design for Learning is Step Zero Towards Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And we're really glad to have you with us at BGSU today, Tom. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Chelsea, for inviting me to be part of the conversation today. I'm grateful to everybody who is here on the live session, as well as those who are going to be watching the recording later. Glad to have your voices and ideas with us. I want to say thank you to everybody who is helping us behind the scenes today. So you've heard from Chelsea and, uh, and Kelsey Meyer, Jeff Smith, Holly Barber, Allison Gedda, and uh, our ASL interpreter, Carrie Strom, and Tricia Winter behind the scenes as well. I'm also grateful to uh, have opportunities for you to take part in lots of different ways today. So. Uh, we're using the webinar features in Zoom, which means that you don't have control over your camera or your microphone, but you do have the chat feature in Zoom, and I am interruptible today. So even if there's a, a spot where suddenly you remember a story that you want to share or you have a question to ask, you can use the raise hand feature in Zoom and our folks behind the scenes will recognize you, we'll call on you, and we'll let you unmute your microphone. So you can take part in lots of different ways. Using the chat, raise your hand to use the microphone, or just write down notes on your own and keep them to yourself. So lots of different ways to connect today. While we're getting started, I want to make you two promises. One, you will leave our session today with at least one practical action that you can take that helps lower barriers for you or for your learners whom you interact with and serve. Promise number two, I am not here to tell you what extra work you need to do. In fact, my goal is to help take work off your plate. I want to help you identify something that you can stop doing or that will help you to reduce your workload in terms of grading, responding to students, or other pinch points or pain points in the interactions that you have with students. And when we're thinking about teaching and learning, on your screen now is the title slide for this session. It's why universal design for learning is step zero toward diversity, equity, and inclusion. There's the Bowling Green State University logo there, and there's a smiling picture of me in a suit. So you know it's a serious thing. As we get started formally, I'd like to do a little bit of framing. So now on your screen uh, are uh, some images that I'll describe in a moment, but I want to say, it's been a rough few years for everyone, right? 
On your screen are images representing three big challenges. On the left, wildfires in the west of North America. There's a car driving through a burning landscape. Protests in support of the Black Lives Matter and Me Too movement. There's an image of protesters marching in Los Angeles. And of course, the profound impact of our recent social distancing and the disruption from the COVID-19 pandemic. There's an image of a man in a coffee shop wearing a mask and he's looking wearily at the camera. Now, those of us who for years have been calling for more inclusive design practices in higher education, we found ourselves suddenly in the forefront of rushed efforts to shift our in-person interactions to remote, hybrid, and online modalities. And we had to settle for good enough changes that allowed the bare essentials of teaching and learning to continue writ broadly. But that rapid shift to remote emergency instruction, that left a lot of people behind. And it uncovered biases and gatekeeper beliefs that many of our colleagues cling to as markers of control or normality in a time that's anything but. Even as we're getting back to campus, we have to get beyond the advice in the books. On the screen is an image of the cover of my book, Reach Everyone, Teach Everyone. And I can promise you that what we're about to talk about today is beyond what's in there. And it goes beyond those guarding the ivory tower moments too. In this session, let's construct ways to advocate for systemic accessibility changes, not just what's happening in your classroom, but what happens at your entire institution. And we'll also want to think about how those changes will pay us back in terms of reduced learner stress and anxiety and we know there's plenty of that around, reduced instructor grading loads. By the way, the mountain of grading that we're all under, that's a problem that we created and we can address. And reduced worry over cheating and increased institutional metrics like tuition income, student retention, and graduation rates. You know, the keep the paychecks coming kind of stuff. So as we're thinking here, Let's do an opening thought exercise. On the screen is an image of a graduation scene in a crowd of graduates in caps and gowns. A college president in academic regalia is giving a fist bump to a smiling graduate. Now, many of us know that Universal Design for Learning, or UDL, is a way to lower access barriers to all types of learning interactions for a broad range of learners. Most campus leaders, though, continue to mistake UDL for a subset of legal accessibility requirements for serving learners with disabilities. So if you had five minutes with one of the leaders at Bowling Green State University, what message would you want to share about accessible design or universal design for learning? We'll put two minutes on the clock for your responses. If you'd like to mute the audio while you're thinking and then turn it back on once the music is over, I'll put a message in the chat feature about when the music will stop. So you can write down your thoughts and keep them just to yourself. Share your response via the chat feature or wait until the thinking time is up and use the raise hand feature to request access to the microphone. When those two minutes are up, we'll give voice to as many responses as we can and try to find some common themes. So here comes two minutes worth of music for thinking. All right, that was two minutes worth of thinking time. And uh, two minutes goes by pretty quickly when you're trying to put your thoughts together. So I see a number of people have shared ideas in the chat. And I want to check with our colleagues behind the scenes to see if anybody has a hand up to come on to the live microphone. So Chelsea, Kelsey, Jeff, can you say whether somebody's uh, got a hand up for the live microphone or not? Jeff is going to be helping us with that. Okay, and do you see anybody who has a hand up to come on the live microphone, Jeff? Not at this time. All right, thank you very much. Much appreciated. So before we dive in on everybody's feedback, you have just learned two different universal design for learning techniques, even if you didn't know that you just learned them. One, universal design for learning is all about giving people 
choices, choices about how they get engaged with a topic, choices about how they take in information, and choices about how they share what they know and take action. So the fact that you had the option to take some notes for yourself, to post something in the chat, or to come onto the live microphone, even if nobody chooses to use the microphone, as we're doing now. That doesn't mean that folks won't want to use the microphone later, and having the choice makes you feel a little bit more free to choose the method that works best for you. And that's what we're all about when we're thinking about inclusive design. So giving people options for how they take action and how they express themselves, that's one universal design for learning technique. The second one that you might have noticed is that I played a little bit of music to give you time to think and respond. Here is a depressing statistic. In most classrooms, instructors, when they ask, are there any questions, they wait an average of six seconds before they say, oh, there's no questions, I'll just keep on going right through with the stuff that I was doing before and I'll continue the lecture. Six seconds is not enough time except for the very fastest thinkers among us to actually come up with a question or an idea or a response. So providing time for quiet, reflection, thought, and responses is another way to lower some barriers for the students in our teaching and learning spaces. So let's give voice to some of those responses and let's talk about a preview of what you're going to see in this keynote conversation. I asked, what would you say if you had five minutes with one of your campus leaders, what would you say to that person about universal design for learning or inclusive design? Carrie says, I talk about access to resources. Many students don't know about resources or are hindered in their ability to seek them out and utilize them. Absolutely. When's the last time you heard my, my students aren't doing the reading or they don't go to the tutoring center or we have mental health counselors who are sitting there waiting for people to come to them and people feel, feel that there's a stigma or that there's uh, you know, some reason why they shouldn't go seek the resources. So especially when we're working with lots of learners who are first generation college learners and at Bowling Green State University, you have a bunch of those. When we're working with learners who have work and family and caregiving and military service commitments, other demands on their time, oftentimes the challenge can be not that they don't know about the resources, but they might not have time to go use the resources when the resources are available. So if your counselors are available Monday through Friday between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m., that's probably not the time when most of your students have time to be able to avail themselves of their services. Let's look at a couple more comments here about what you would say to your leaders. By the way, Carrie's message about getting access to resources is a wonderful thing for leaders to hear. Liz says, Universal Design for Learning implementation increases access to course content for all of our students, regardless of the barriers or hurdles they face, whether it's technology or its ability. I like the way you frame that part. It also increases access via the methods students can demonstrate their learning in a course. So Liz knows a few things about UDL already, I think, and I like the way that she's framing you know, she's talking to her leader not about students with disabilities. She's also saying, by the way, this is going to help lower barriers for people on their mobile devices or people who only get their, their internet at a coffee shop because they don't have it at home. Interesting statistic in, the, in your county and the four surrounding counties, 89% of adults in the Pew Internet survey said that they owned a smartphone. Only 40% of adults said that they had a laptop or a desktop computer at home. You tell me how your students are interacting with content when they are away from the formal spaces at your university. 
Kate says, I would agree to what Dr. Tobin said. Uh, inclusivity is not extra work. It makes everything simpler. I'll also add to what Kate is saying here and say that inclusive design and universal design for learning and our diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts, they do require work. They do require intentional effort. My way of looking at it, though, is that we should be selecting actions where we know that the work we put in now will save us effort and frustration and anxiety and fuss and work later. And that's where we're going to go with a lot of the keynote today. Chelsea says, taking a proactive approach rather than a reactive approach to accessibility helps to reduce othering and can create belonging. I love that message. And what do you think your leaders would say about that? They would want to know, well, what specific things should we be doing? They want to see projects. They want to see measurable results. So the, the sense of belonging or the sense of being othered, being apart from or a part of, how do you measure that? That's a question that a provost might ask. And it's one that we are going to answer today. Allison says, professional development opportunities beyond awareness that UDL needs to be part of our learning experiences for students. So asking your leader for funding or people or time for professional development and training. Big gold star on this one. Um, Allison says, instructors need to prioritize this work and learn how to do UDL and why. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share a sneaky thing that I'll share at the end here too, but I want to preview it a little bit. It shouldn't be just faculty members who are responsible for inclusive design. And we'll talk about that as we get going here. And uh, Angela says, make it an overtly valued instructional method and provide training. So here's a plus one for requesting training or time from your leaders to actually dig in. So the teaching and learning symposium that we're involved in today is part of that. And if you had your president's ear for a couple of minutes, you'd ask for more specific resources. Lovely. Kate says, it seems to be such an intuitive and simple thing when you just increase the waiting time for learners to engage, but I personally found myself feeling awkward when I ask a question and don't get an immediate answer. I guess it's about changing my attitude first. Kate, I love the, the way that you are being reflective about your own practices here. And I am like you. When I am in a classroom with students and I say, does anybody have a question? Or I say, somebody ask me a question before I go on. Believe me, that actually makes a huge shift. I want to wait and I know exactly what I, I want to say next. So I don't want to wait very off, very long. And that silence can get awkward, which is why I use that music cue. It's actually a way to get me to be quiet in a way that doesn't feel like it's an awkward silence where people kind of look at each other and go, are you gonna ask? No, I thought I didn't have a question. Are you going to ask? But having that music there means everybody can have a little something that holds the time. So I'd encourage you to use either a music cue or even you know setting a metronome going or asking or even putting a countdown timer on uh, that's projected for your students to see. Just have something that holds the space and allows them to be reflective. Julie also says here that when she gets her five minutes with a leader, she would talk about more resources being needed. Uh, Julie says she appreciates the Canvas Studio tool that creates closed captioning, but we need a tool for audio description for film and video. That's a, either a tool or a human being. So today we have the, the benefit of having our uh, American Sign Language interpreters working with us. And you can also turn the sub the automatic generated uh, live caption subtitles on and off. You'll see that control probably under the more link in Zoom because it's all the way down at the end of the row there. But you can see the automatic subtitles for our session today. Thank you, everybody for an opening thought exercise, even before we defined what universal design for learning or diversity, equity, and inclusion are, I can tell that we have a good understanding collectively about some of the things we would want to ask for from our president, our provost, and campus leaders at Bowling Green State. So 
Now let's dive in a little bit. On your screen now is an image of actress Sharina Clanton speaking into a megaphone during a protest organized by Aboriginal rights activists in Melbourne, Australia. As you experienced with that thought exercise just now, one goal of our session today is to provide you with language, models, and practices to situate UDL, <coughs> excuse me, within programs that your campus leaders already support. Pardon me a moment. One of the reasons why this glass of water is full, pardon me. So we wanna give you some ways that you can work with your campus leaders to talk in language that they already know, things they're already supporting, like your diversity, equity, and inclusion, DEI efforts, as well as bottom line budget arguments. Those are the things that release funding and people and time. In order to advocate effectively for adopting inclusive practices across our programs, instructors, staff members, department chairs, directors, we all need to be able to change the mindset among our senior leader colleagues so that universal design for learning is perceived as an always fund mission critical set of practices for the entire campus. And we heard that in some of the requests that you were making to your senior leaders in that thought exercise. We have to go from, it's the right thing to do, but we don't have time, we don't have funds, we don't have people, to we all must do this. So let's define what we're talking about. On your screen now is an image of students studying together in a classroom. One student has his hands on a keyboard, everyone's got a laptop, and one student is pointing to an off-camera screen where another student is projecting his computer. So when we say universal design for learning, this is what we mean. This is the familiar multiple means of engagement, representation, and action and expression. This is the official definition from the neuroscientists at CAST, the Center for Applied Special Technology in Boston. They discovered back in the early 1990s that when we learn anything as human beings, whether we are six years old or 60 years old, we have to activate three different chemical pathways in our brains in order for that learning to stick. They figured out that those three different chemical pathways translated roughly into having a why. So that's multiple means of engagement and getting to a sense that I need to learn this and then getting engaged and sticking with it even though it might be difficult or challenging. They found that people stuck with things when they had more than one way that they could choose to start up with the content, uh, giving people multiple ways to estimate how much time something is going to take or multiple ways to work on the intro part of a learning task or a learning activity. Then what they discovered, the next phase was the what of learning. This is multiple means of representing information. This is what we often think about when we think about accessibility. This is putting captions on your videos. This is having text transcripts for your audio podcasts, making alternative text for still images. This is describing what's on the screen even when you're in the same room with people or you're on the same webinar with them not because everyone here has a hearing impairment, but because some of you might be fixing lunch right now and just listening to the session. So describing what's on the screen allows you to play along and follow along more easily. And then the last part of that learning process, you have the why, you have the what, and you need a how. You need to actually practice, see if you've got it, try things out, test, experiment, and giving people more than one way to show what they know take action or express themselves, allows people as learners to exercise voice, choice, and agency. You feel like you have a little bit of a say in how you show what you know. And that is multiple means of action and expression. So this is the official definition from CAST. When we say universal design for learning to our campus leaders though, 
they end up making an essential mental mistake. They think about disability accommodations because our methods and our concepts overlap between UDL and accommodation supports. And this is what we mean by disability accommodations, making one change, one time for one person. This is your student who comes to you with the piece of paper from your disability support office and says, I need time and a half on my tests, and I need a human being to be there when I take the test in case I need some words read out loud to me. Now that one change, one time for one person, legally required to do it, yep, and it's work that we never see coming. We can't say, oh yes, I plan to have a couple of people with learning uh, disabilities and a couple of people with visual challenges and maybe three hearing uh, challenges among my students and I'll, I'll make sure that I'm ready for them you know, weeks in advance of the class. No, they come to us if they choose to disclose a disability challenge and that paperwork is almost now, you know, late by two weeks or, or, or whatnot, because our, ch our folks in the disability services office, they're often kind of overrun. Now, that's actually good news. More people are studying in our universities who, in years past, we wouldn't have even let them in. They're smart people and capable people but we're trying to lower barriers for people with disabilities. So I have to be careful when I say what I'm about to say next. When we are talking with our campus leaders, if we lead with accessibility accommodations, if we lead with, here's something we can do to serve our students who have disabilities, we will get discounted in their minds. Oh, that's just for a niche population. That's just for those students over there. That's only for a small percentage of our students. Now, I'm not going to argue the point that it's more like a third of our students have some condition that could be considered a disabling condition in their environments. And the barriers that we can lower shouldn't all take place on the one change one time for one person stage. What we should be doing is lowering barriers for lots of people at once. Making one change one time for one person, it's the right thing to do, and it's horribly resource intensive. So it's a lot of work. And so we could be able to, we could be able to do that work and lower barriers for a lot of people at once. Will we ever be able to get rid of our disability services office? No. Universal design for learning is not some magic wand that we wave that cures a problem or, or makes a challenge go away. What it does do, though, is it makes it much less likely that people will have to put a hand up and say, treat me individually differently. And for those people who do still need those individual affordances, it actually frees up our student with disability services office colleagues to give them more sustained attention for those individual cha changes that they need. So the challenge here, if our leaders are thinking about all of that work that goes into meeting the legal requirements of one change, one person, one time, when we say everyone should adopt UDL, it becomes a losing argument. So why would we put in all of that, and I'll put air quotes, extra work just to address barriers for what campus leaders guess is close to one or 2% of the students at their colleges? And yeah, we know it's a lot more people. So coming with this multiple means argument is often seen as being a niche request from a narrow field that serves a tiny number of students. No wonder we don't get traction for it. We have to get universal design for learning as a concept into the larger DEI argument. So it's hard to get ability-based arguments into those larger DEI conversations, too. On the screen is an image of six students smiling for the camera, and there are three men and three women. We have white, 
Black, Latina, and Asian students represented, this is the sort of diversity that comes to mind for most campus leaders, acceptance of learners from varying ethnic and gender identity backgrounds. We don't yet collectively think of the ability spectrum as yet another top level way of thinking about diversity, although that's changing thanks to autistic, advocates, people in deaf culture, a capital D, and others who argue that having a separate disabilities office can also be an othering thing with atyp that uh, people with atypical bodies and brains may feel uncomfortable interacting with. So what's the secret sauce for getting UDL traction in our campus DEI conversations? It's counterintuitive. We should stop talking about disabilities, at least not first, and not exclusively. Now, again, I have to be careful here because that risks erasure on the part of people who really do need to be visible, seen, and heard in our arguments. So let me clarify what I'm talking about. Now on the screen is that image of the students studying again, this time with a red circle and a slash through it over the multiple means definition of UDL. Now, as an advocate for the educational rights of people with disabilities, I'm really careful when I say stop talking about disability. If it's the first or only framework within which we perform our advocacy, we're going to end up running into that, that discounting that we heard. If our campus leaders perceive us as advocating, though, for a small group of students and in a narrowly applicable sense, of course they'll say it's the right thing to do and it's a low priority. So how do we frame our DEI arguments to include UDL and other inclusive design principles without erasing the visibility of groups who've been traditionally marginalized or excluded from strategic conversations? We learn how our campus leaders make decisions. And I'd like to, to offer a, a, a quick check-in with everybody. Let me put one minute of music on and I'd like to ask a, a different question here. In fact, let me just stop the share here and take the, the visuals down here. I'd just like to ask a very open question. What's on your mind right now? Am I sparking ideas or questions? But let's pause for just one minute of music and I'll ask what's on your mind. And again, you can write something down if you're watching the recording or you just keep it to yourself. Post it in the chat and we'll give voice to it and respond or use the raise hand feature and we'll bring you on the live microphone as well. So here comes a minute of me to remind everybody that I am interruptible today. So uh, if you, even if it's not a space where we are formally pausing, if you have an idea or a question or a story to share, put it in the chat or raise your hand and we'll recognize you and you can come onto the live microphone. So in our check-in here, we have some ideas in the chat Kelsey is saying, trying to roll out or implement universal design for learning across campus could be very overwhelming without the right support. And this is absolutely true. It's one of the reasons why only about 10% of instructors nationwide and across North America are using inclusive design practices of any kind, including universal design for learning. In order for it to be all across your entire institution, you have to have buy-in and support from your campus leaders. I'll uh, throw a quick plug in here while I'm on the video. I'm holding up a book called UDL University. It just came out from our colleagues at Goodwin University, G-O-O-D-W-I-N. And they have shared their stories of how they implemented universal design for learning across their entire organization. Here are some other comments in the chat. Allison says, how can we foster a stronger focus on student ability rather than disability? All students have exceptionalities. Excellent question and well framed as well, Allison. You'll notice that I'm talking not about disabled students. I do not ascribe to the medical model that disability resides in our bodies. Disability is when the environment that we find ourselves in doesn't allow us to do what we want to do. Imagine a student who gets around using a wheelchair. The student comes up to a building and there are four steps to be able to get up to the front door. Where's the disability? 
The disability isn't in the student's ability to get around. The student can get around just fine in a wheelchair. The disability is in the environment. The disability is that the environment is not designed to allow that person to make use of that physical space. The same thing is true in the learning interactions that we have with our students. If we have a student uh, with a hearing disability or a visual disability, those challenges are not inherent in the students. It doesn't mean that they are somehow less able to learn. It means that the way that we have designed our curriculum, our environments, or our interactions doesn't yet allow them to express themselves and take part in the way that they can do best. Now, there's a, a challenge for us with universal design for learning. We can look at the enormity of trying to proactively make designs for all of the different possibilities of intersectional identities that could come into our classrooms we would burn ourselves out trying to do all of that design work proactively. We would suffer from analysis paralysis and maybe never even start. So what I always suggest to folks is adopt a plus one mentality. Identify those kinds of learning interactions that are happening now where there's only one way that students can do it. And then plus one make one more way. If there's a video that you've recorded to welcome students to a particular unit, give students one more way to get that information, like a text transcript or putting captions on your video. If there's one way for students to show what they know, write me a three-page essay. Make one more way that they could show what they know that uses the same grading and assessment criteria, like turning their selfie camera on their phones to good use and saying, hey, I'm pretending to be a news reporter and I'll tell you the same information that would have gone into that written format. So I, I love the way Allison is framing that to focus on student ability rather than disability. Shift your brain away from disability residing in people's bodies and start looking at disabling conditions in the environments in which they are working. Julie says that she appreciates all the points that uh, we're making and how we're modeling UDL in terms of describing the images on your slides in a way that flows, not as an add-on, for visually impaired or, as you said, someone listening and making lunch. Uh, it's That's actually one of the low-hanging fruit kinds of techniques that we can adopt for universal design for learning is getting in the habit of making the visual things that we're talking about part of the conversation. I try to select visuals not just because they're decorative or pretty, but because they help me to make a point and therefore describing what's on the screen actually runs into the conversation in my class. I teach English composition and so I use visuals in a composing, excuse me, in a composing way all the time. So Julie, thank you for the comment. Carrie says, I'm writing down ideas and I'll be sharing with faculty. I've always been a believer of allowing students to show what they know through a variety of methods. I think this is so important. Not everyone is a good test taker. And Carrie is saying something important. There are brilliant individuals at our universities who stink at taking multiple choice and timed tests and who are otherwise absolutely brilliant folks. And if they had a chance to show you what they know in some other fashion, would knock your socks off. So I, I love that. Thank you, Carrie. Chelsea says discussing UDL in the context of student success, that's how you unlock money and time and support from your campus leaders. So we're gonna get into that next. Thank you, Chelsea. Kristen says, thinking through ways to advocate for uh, increased staffing and adjusted roles to support UDL for instructors. We'll actually talk about that at the very end of our time today. This is an important lesson to take away about inclusive design by itself. And that is, if we keep the responsibility for inclusive methods on faculty and instructor shoulders only, it's no wonder that not much is going to happen because we're already busy with 
teaching a full load of classes, our own research, advising students, serving on committees. We're already weighed up to here. So we do need it to be an all campus effort. So thank you, Kristen. Chelsea has also posted a link to the UDL diversity book into the chat. So thank you very much for finding that link. Fantastic. Let me go back to the, the presentation screen share here. And let's build off of some of the ideas that you've all just shared. Let's talk about not only how do we implement universal design for learning in an individual way, but let's start thinking about inclusive design at scale as part of your diversity, equity, and inclusion measures on campus. So now on the screen, you see some graduating college students in caps and gowns. They're throwing their caps in the air. And this is what our senior leaders pay attention to. Success stories that show our university as a place where people achieve their goals and dreams. The reason that DEI efforts are such buzzwords right now is that inclusive language and practices help with the bottom line budget issues that most leaders focus on first. And on your screen, it says, what always gets funded? Here are those things. Persistence. We want more students who are there on the first day of class to still be there to take the final exam. Retention. We want more students who take a course with me now to come back and take a course with you later and eventually to complete their programs of study. And satisfaction. We want students to report that their experience of being learners with us was a supportive, positive, meaningful one. And we want them to tell their friends come study with us as well. So why isn't UDL part of this argument already in the minds of many campus leaders? Well. In other words, the DEI argument that resonates most strongly with campus leaders is that none of the diversity efforts that they are championing now will work at all unless students have access to the information, services, and people who can support them. Access is the step zero that makes all the other DEI principles actually work. And you'll notice that I've made a, a subtle shift here. I started out talking about accessibility. And when we say accessibility, well, that's the challenge here. We're moving away from that, which carries the overtones of individual disability accommodations. And we're starting to use the language of access, chop the end of the word off from accessibility to access in terms of control of, control of content, interactions, support, and people. How do we give our learners access to all of those things, both in our formal interactions with them and especially beyond them, especially when they're on their own time with their families, at their jobs, where they're trying to sneak 20 minutes into their day for studying, preparing, practicing, homework, and the like. Now, on the screen is a more inclusive image of college diversity. This is a group of 16 people from various racial, gender, and ability-based profiles. One person has a service dog, one person uses a wheelchair. What do they all have in common? Needing access to the parts of their education that help them to feel a part of rather than apart from. So now on the screen is the type of diversity where UDL can echo our existing DEI statements and commitments. A student is sitting on her couch doing classwork. She has her backpack near, there's a textbook open, and she's writing in a notebook. Her young son is asleep on her lap and uh, he's hugging a stuffed animal to his chest. This is the sort of student whom campus leaders focus on intently people who could be successful learners with us if only they were able better to balance their studies against their work, family, caregiving, and other commitments. So how do we frame universal design for learning in these kinds of terms? We should focus on four must-have access types of interactions that learners engage in as part of their overall success. Now, we've already talked about shifting from an accessibility framework to an access framework, one that encompasses all of our learners and the various barriers that they have in their lives. Mobile device ownership, 
time crunches, family, and work commitments. So when you talk with your campus leaders about how inclusive design practices like UDL help all of our online and technology mediated learners and even folks who are just using technology in the face to face environment. Helping them to reduce the various barriers that they have in their lives mobile device ownership time crunches family and work commitments. So what we want to do is we want to say to our leaders. Wouldn't it be great if we could find 20 more minutes for studying for all of our students every day? Give them options for interacting with the things that you see on your screen. Interacting with materials or content. This is what everyone thinks about when we think about accessibility. Remember captions on videos, transcripts for your podcasts, alternative text for your still images. We've actually got a good handle on how to do that part. This is where we all start. But think also about how do students have access to each other? How do they connect with one another outside of our formal course interactions? What spaces does the institution provide for collaboration, studying, and interaction? Yes, there's great studying space in the library, but that means students have to be on campus to do that. In the way before times, it was assumed that students would come to campus and they'd be residential students, right? They'd live in the residence halls. And if they wanted to get together, they would meet at a bar and they'd have pizza and beer. And that would be a study session. It's wonderful if that was your undergraduate experience. And, and I'm grateful that you had it. My undergraduate experience was family commitments and being a commuter student and not really feeling like I was part of the campus. So any way that we can provide spaces, either physical ones or virtual ones where students can get together and connect, even if it's over Zoom like this, or it's phone calls with each other, or it's ways to study with the materials for our courses, that's to the good. If we can help the busy single mom who has to dr drop her kids off at school and then drive to work and then drive to campus after she picks the kids up from school, if we can give that person just 20 more minutes for studying during her day, that can be the difference between struggling and keeping up. And that's an argument that our leaders need to hear. We should also think about how we are expanding access to the institution itself. Our university is much more than just instructors. So how do students know about and get multiple ways for access to support staff, librarians, mental health counselors, the financial aid office, tutoring, academic advising, extracurricular opportunities. In our opening brainstorming, one of our colleagues talked about how it was essential that students know what services are available to them. And it was a shame that students don't take greater advantage of those services. And then the last piece, this one is a, a, a key. How do we give people more than one way to interact with their community? It sounds counterintuitive, but the more we can get students away from their computers and their mobile phones, and the more engaged they're likely to be. Get them connecting with colleagues in your field, people in your community who work with your concepts that you teach. Get students working on real projects, real problems, or at least communicating and hearing the stories from those who are using the skills and knowledge that you exemplify in your classroom and your learning interactions. The less your courses and interactions are a self-contained box, the better off you're going to be. Now, the image on the screen here shows all four of these online learner access interactions at once. It's a group of three students sitting at an outdoor cafe table. One has a laptop, another one's working on her phone, and a third has a book in front of him. So they're using all of the different pieces here. I'd like to, to ask you to do a little writing now, and we'll take some time here for this. On the screen are five faculty senate members sitting at a table with some microphones. One man is speaking and gesturing. Let's take time to do a little role playing using the ideas that we've talked about so far. So in the next, say, 10 minutes, I'd like you to draft one of three conversations. And I'd like to give you the opportunity to do this on your own or in conversation with colleagues as we go. So we'll uh, put together some breakout rooms here, if that's possible. 
So in your current role, describe a UDL implementation in language that your leaders would recognize and follow. In other words, create a pitch for universal design for learning to a campus leader. Or take on the role of a campus leader and draft a request for an inclusive design project to a department or unit. Pretend that you're the provost or you're the dean and you're asking the department chair to actually implement an inclusive design process. Or describe a current diversity, equity, or inclusion goal at your college or university here that would benefit from broader access. So think from the perspective of DEI and think about the access needs of the people who are involved in those DEI conversations. So I'll put some, uh, I'll put about 10 minutes of time on the clock here, and I want to check in with our, our colleagues behind the scenes. Since we're using the webinar version here, I don't think we have breakout rooms available. Is that right? That is correct. Breakouts are not available. Okay, no worries. In which case, let me just put 10 minutes of, of thinking time on the clock here. And what I'd love for you to do is open up a word processing file or find a place to take notes or even just grab a pen and a piece of paper and write down your thoughts about one of these prompts that are on the screen. I'll put these prompts into the chat as well. And then once the 10 minutes are up, I'd love to have a couple of people come on the live microphone and share, or if you'd like, put the outline version of your talking points into the chat and we'll give voice to those. So let's take 10 minutes for a little thinking and writing exercise here. Bear with me for a second and we'll get the, the music going here as well. All right, welcome back, everybody. Thank you very much for taking a concerted effort at a little thinking and doing. We wanted to take about 10 minutes to give you enough time to really dig in and do a little drafting for yourself. If you've been watching the recording, glad to have you back here. For those of you who are here on the live session, I'd love to hear what your talking points were either put the main talking points into the chat and we can talk them through here or use that raise hand feature it looks like we've got uh one person who wants to come on to the live microphone here and that's uh carrie carrie did you want to come on and share what you were thinking and which prompt you were responding to thank you yeah i wanted to share about a current dei effort so in our college we have a dei fellow um that's kind of a new position for us. And one of the initiatives that we've already got going is in May, we're having students from um, Toledo in the inner city um, come down to campus. So we've arranged for them to be bused here uh, to interact with our faculty here in the College of Health and Human Services. Um, and, and so we're thinking this is twofold. One, give them the opportunity to come to a college campus um, and see what that's like. But also a lot of our um, degrees in this college are known to be um, not very diverse. And so we really feel like by exposing folks like around seventh, eighth grade to these different majors, it then allows them to think about the possibilities, take the right classes maybe in high school so they are prepared for that college degree and hoping to form those relationships to help those students gain access to some possibilities. Well, that's splendid. And, and what kinds of access are these pre-college folks going to need? I heard one access, which is literally getting on a bus or some other transportation to get to campus. But what other kinds of access would they need in order to be successful meeting those goals that you just outlined? Um, I, you know, one of the goals too is to continue contact with them because mm -hmm. I find a lot of, especially our first generation college students don't have that social collateral to understand how to navigate the process of where am I going to school? What does that even mean? I need financial aid. Who do I have as an ally to help me, you know, get through all of those things? So I think that's an important part. We are feeding them. So I'm a dietitian. Uh, so we're giving them some brain power while they're here too. <laughs> Uh, they're not missing any meals or having to bring their own lunch, which could be um, a barrier for some too. Um, so, and we're doing hands-on fun activities while they're here too. Awesome. And now I'm also thinking about after they leave, after they had that one experience, 
uh, what would they need access to in order to continue with that conversation? So having people's email addresses and phone numbers and, uh, you know, having sort of a cheat sheet of what do I do next or what are the next steps and having that process laid out. Here are five steps that you should do over the next couple of weeks and maybe checking in with their teachers uh, at their K-12 institutions to give them time and space to continue doing those five steps as they go through the process. So this is one of the ways that we can expand access and lower barriers for DEI is when we are thinking about people in terms of their intersectional identities. So we all bring lots of different backgrounds into the workplace, into our education, into the learning that we do. When we're thinking about those intersectional identities, how do we help people to feel like they are a part of the conversation with us? So I love the way that you're framing that. So thank you for sharing the, the ID. Awesome. In the chat, we've got Allison saying, sharing Daffy brainstorm notes in a Google Doc. Allison, would you be willing to uh, either key in the, the main points there here in the chat or come on the live microphone? and share your ideas with us? Well, I didn't intend to use the word Daffy. I intended for drafty. Oh, drafty. OK, great. And so, yeah, you know, I was kind of scribing some things down and, and going from some of the um, promotional things that I know our, our industry leaders share about innovative practices and things that we need to have in our higher education institutions uh, in order to be proactive for the future. And it always comes back to the data-driven decision-making process and how we really fail to collect information from faculty and students um, in, in what their needs really are. And as researchers at this institution, it, it just boggles my mind that we haven't really taken a, that I know of, a very deep look at asking faculty members what they really completely understand about innovation and change and technology um, and, and using the tools and expertise that we have in order to leverage our ideas. Um, I know we do spend a fair amount of time accounting for our practices uh, through our accreditation process, but mm -hmm. it seems to me that um, a strong effort for a needs assessment for data-driven decision-making could also be the backbone of some of the accreditation data that we use um, to extend continuous improvement opportunities. And so I think if I were to um, have a little coffee talk with some of our leaders, I would, I would extend those ideas and um, offer opportunities for uh, participating in a team of colleagues that would collect that information and whether it be qualitative or quantitative in surveying our faculty members, uh, I think it would be really rich data. I, I love the focus on data empowered decision making where you have enough information to be able to confidently say, here's a change that we want to make or here's a position we need to fund or here's some training that everybody needs you heard in our opening brainstorming how people were going to talk to the senior leaders about we need formal training in this, we need time just to that we, you know, it's release time from our teaching or our other roles in order to be able to sit down and and hash out what exactly we want to do. Allison, I wanna move in a, the other direction from the way you went as well and say that one of the most powerful accessibility and access tools that we have at our disposal is asking students about their experiences. I always in week two of my courses, and I've gotten everyone in my department to do this as well, I ask an anonymous survey in the learning management system and it has two questions in it. One is a closed ended question. It is, how much of the reading have you been able to do up until now in the course? And it's 100%, 80%, 60, 40, 20. I'm so sorry, professor, I haven't been doing the reading. The second question is an open ended question. And it is, what is one thing that is getting in the way of you being able to give your best effort to this class. I asked that question in week two out of 15 so that I will have enough time to actually respond 
to trends and patterns that I see in the students' responses. It's never the same semester to semester. Sometimes I have a bunch of people who are all working night shift at UPS. Sometimes I have a bunch of people who have caregiving responsibilities. Sometimes it's a mix. And so I like to be able to say, here are some of the shifts and changes that we can do because I'm listening to you. I made space for you to tell me what's going on in your lives. And that's a really powerful way that we might wrap up our conversation today. I don't, uh, I want to make some space for other folks, but I don't see folks in the chat putting in your, uh, your key points yet here. But it's a good way to think about universal design for learning in terms of the diversity and inclusion and equity efforts that we're making on campus. Those DEI efforts are meant to expand the people who feel they belong with us. Also, the UDL approach of making multiple ways for students to get and stay engaged, multiple ways for them to take in information from us, and multiple ways for them to show what they know, that supports the kind of access and belonging that we want to see on our campuses. And you'll notice that I hope I have, have done my promise to you well, that I have given you at least one thing you could do that's going to take some work off your plate. Start with those places where things aren't going the way that you had thought you wanted them to over and over and over again already. Start with those pinch points. Where do students send you the same question by email 700 times every time you teach a class? Where do students end up collectively getting a concept wrong on a test or a quiz and you end up having to reteach? Those are the places where a little intentional effort pays us back. And with that in mind, on your screen now is a different image. It's a table laden with food. There's tortilla chips and guacamole and salsa and roasted corn and tortillas and black beans and a liter margarita in a glass jar. This is takeaway food that I hope puts you in mind of what you'll take away from this session. So now that you've been part of our conversation, what's one thing that you'll take away and try out, whether it's an idea or a practice? We won't play any music for this. We'll do this as a lightning round wrap up. Please share one thing in the chat that you'll take away from our time together, and I'll repeat as many as I can. And I'll put this in the chat here, too. I'll just say, what's your one big takeaway? So far, we have a few responses. I hope some more will come in here, too. Chelsea is saying the plus one philosophy of design. Absolutely. Plus one thinking is not all that universal design for learning is. It is a wonderful way to start and give yourself a task that is manageable and you can put boundaries around it. We can say, there's so much work that we could do. Let's do the work first in the places that's going to give us the best reward for the effort that we're putting into it. Kelsey says UDL is for everyone. Learner variability is the norm. That's absolutely true. The old, the sort of golden old days when all of our students were, you know, physically able white men, that's like the 1920s gang. And that was a horribly exclusionary period in higher education. Today, we want to lower the barriers for as many people as we can. We want smart kids and smart adults to come study with us and be successful. Allison is saying vision and inspiration. Excellent. Julie says the, two, the week two survey that you just mentioned. Awesome. I'm great, grateful you're going to try that. Uh, Josh says surveying students more often for what we can do to make them feel a part of our class or program. By the way, if you get useful feedback from your students on the end of semester student ratings, it's too late to help those students. And what you do in response to your students from this past semester might not be a good thing to help your students for next semester. So if you can get to them early and just ask, how's it going? 
what's going on? Then you can actually adjust. You can make adjustments. And even if you're explaining why you can't do something that they want you to do, having that explanation means they'll trust you more when you say, you know what, this one's difficult. I think you can do it and I'm here to help you do it. Awesome. Gary says, have UDL echo your DEI statements. Diversity, equity, and inclusion are already things that your campus is adopting. They're already things that your leaders want to get behind. So put UDL inside those efforts as you're doing. And Jessica says the importance of asking students how they're doing. So that's a wonderful takeaway from today. Awesome deal. I want to say thank you to everybody for being here as part of this session. Now on your screen, it looks like the title slide. There's my image and the Bowling Green State University logo. I'd love it if you take a couple of minutes and rate our session from today. Was this experience a useful one for you? What didn't we talk about that you wanted to hear? Was it a good use of your time? And we've got about eight minutes left in our 90 minutes. Here's another universal design for learning secret at the very end. If you want people to rate your session, give them some time to do it. Usually if you say, hey, here's the rating link and I'm sorry, but we've only got 30 seconds and we have to go, 99% of folks will say, I have good intentions to do the rating. And then they just run out of time or they forget or other things get in the way. So if you want your students to do something, if you want them to think and respond, if you want them to do a quick writing prompt like we did now, if you want them to rate a session or you want them to give feedback, make time for them to do it. So I'm grateful to our hosts for helping us uh, keep things going here. Grateful to our American Sign Language interpreters. And for all of you who are going to be watching the session, thank you for watching as well. I hope that you were able to pause, take some notes, and take away at least one thing that takes work off your plates for your work. So thanks everybody for engaging with the, the rating form at the end here. And here's the title slide again. I'll say thank you to everybody and turn it back over to Chelsea for closing remarks and further information about the symposium. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tom, for such an engaging and um, exciting presentation that really was, you know, it had things that we can take away and be able to um, use these ideas to advocate for access on our campus. So I really appreciate that. I know that I have a, a, a notepad full of notes that I'm going to be taking and the CFE team and I will be talking about this as well as many of the faculty who are here today, faculty and, and instructors who are here today. So just a couple of housekeeping notes. One, thank you for posting the um, link for your survey, uh, your rating survey. Um, please go ahead and take some time to fill that out. We do have a break right now um, from 1.30 until 2 p.m. 2 p.m. is when our next uh, group of concurrent sessions begins. And just as a reminder, please go to the Teaching and Learning Summit website page to find the Zoom links for the, um, for the concurrent sessions. And I'm going to go ahead and post that in the chat just in case folks need to see it again. And while Chelsea's posting that, I'll say thank you to everybody for inviting me to be part of your session. I hope you enjoy the rest of the, of the work today. Take care. Thank you. And I hope everyone has a great afternoon and a wonderful lunch break. <laughs>